שלום לכל התלמידים, תלמידות, אני בר חיום מסוכנות החלל הישראלית. כיף שהצטרפתם אלינו למשדר המיוחד הזה של אקדמיה ברשת לכבוד שבוע החלל הישראלי 2024, ביוזמת סוכנות החלל הישראלית במשרד החדשנות, המדע והטכנולוגיה ובשיתוף משרד החינוך. אני שמח להזמין היום את רנדי ברזניק. הוא אסטרונאוט נאס"א מ-2006, ולפני כמה שנים, ב-2017, הוא אפילו היה מפקד תחנת החלל הבינלאומית. אז... הולך להיות ממש מעניין לשמוע מה הוא יספר, בואו נשמע אותו. Now I want to say greetings to astronaut Randy Bresnik. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, shalom. <laughs> My name is Bar and I'm from uh, the Israel Space Agency. I first want to thank you, Randy, for talking to uh, students across Israel on this special event for the Israel Space Week. I actually remember your visits uh, to Israel last year. It was a thrill having you here and I'm so glad that you could take the time being us with us again on on screen. Uh, my pleasure. Last year was amazing going from north to south, east to west. It was a uh, wonderful to see the excitement and the interest, you know, and and just frankly the uh, amazing forward leaps that people in Israel are making towards space. And so to all talk to all these students going there's a place for you, you know, in space in the, you know, in Israel uh, was an exciting message to be able to share. So where are you speaking to us from now? I am at the Johnson Space Center right now. Um, not orbiting above the Bahamas, as you see in the background, <laughs> but you know, it's a green screen, but that's the wonder of technology. And, the, and so it, uh, we've got people that are up on the space station right now that do have that view. You know, we've got uh, humans in, you know, now 25 years of, you know, continuous human presence uh, on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. And people are seeing this view every day. Uh, and it was wonderful to see, uh, you know, an Israeli in uh, Eitan Steve, you know, just last year up there, seeing it with his eyes and be able to come back to Israel and share his story. It's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, we would, we would love to uh, learn from you about your life as an astronaut abroad, uh, aboard the ISS. How did you become an astronaut? Please tell us all about it. Uh, Well, if you don't mind, I've got some slides here to put pictures to the words because I have a face for radio. So I, I use the, the, the pictures and the videos to kind of show space and, uh, from a human's uh, point of view. And if you'd like, I'll get started with that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be excellent. All right. Well, um, on the screen, that's a picture I took. And that is uh, looking up to the Northeast. And hopefully students are going, hey, that looks maybe a little familiar. Notice that dark area on the right bottom right corner that's the Nile River and it goes into Cairo and the Alexandria and the Nile River Delta on the bottom side it's uh it's uh and then just beyond that what do you see you see Israel you see Lebanon you see you know you guys right there just before you see that sunrise coming up over the horizon in the east and so I'll show you the astros point of view what it took to get here and uh Let's see if we can get this thing moving. Just a sec. All right. There we go. Um, but we have to also, you know, start off and remember, you know, this is uh, was the day of remembrance here at NASA for, you know, the um, uh, tragedies that we've had in space, our Apollo 1, uh, Challenger, and Columbia. And certainly, you know, this is, this is Columbia, you know, and this was the Columbia crew where, you know, Elon Ramon, Uh, the namesake of this space week you know was on board and this you know was where we have a memorial tree grove for the astronauts that have passed and and this is his tree where we have the uh, you know israeli flag and we remember him and his sacrifice every year and certainly you know he dreamed of you know um you know being a pilot but astronaut was so far out there um you know but yet it was a dream that um you know he had as someone who loved to fly And certainly, you know, he did that uh, as far as an Israeli pilot and then as a, an astronaut, you know, here with his crew doing experiments that were on board, you know, living with his, his crew members up there. Um, and it was, you know, certainly a tragedy to, to have him not be able to come back from his flight and share that amazing experience with, with uh, the people of Israel. But last year, you know, that changed. And, you know, having Eitan able to, Come, you know, do his flight and come back and share just the wonder 
of what it was like to be able to, you know, be in microgravity, look back at the earth and see it from that perspective. Was certainly, certainly wonderful. You know, we had a crew member from Canada. Uh, he flew with a couple of Americans. And it was certainly wonderful to see how he could show people in Israel the human part and, and have Israel not just be rockets and satellites and or, or lunar rovers, you know, putting people up there and having an Israeli astronaut and, and bringing that tangible part back um, to the people of Israel was certainly, a, you know, a wonderful part of his mission. For me, um, it was, uh, I started out as a F-18 pilot in the Marine Corps and became a test pilot, flying everything I could get my hands on. I just, I like like Elon and Aton, I just love flying. Uh, unfortunately, none of those vehicles could ever get going fast enough to escape Earth's gravity. So I applied to NASA and in 2004 was selected in the, in the astronaut class. We had a wide variety of people in this group. I mean, there was two of us pilots. We had medical doctors, engineers, a, a Navy SEAL, uh, three educators, three Japanese, uh, an astrophysicist. And so it was a wide variety of backgrounds uh, as ast professional astronauts. And that's what we need. We need people from all different backgrounds because when we go to uh, you know, do long duration missions to Mars and things like that, it's not just going to be, you know, a bunch of pilots. We, you know, we might need a psychologist. We might need a botanist. We might need a plumber. We might need a, a masseuse. You know, we don't know yet. And so it'll be really interesting and, and creative people, you know, a cinematographer to record the whole thing. So there's all kinds of you know neat opportunities where humans with their special talents are going to be able to contribute to uh, to space. Got a chance to fly uh, in Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2009 on my first flight. Mission to the International Space Station where we we're doing spacewalks and finishing up the construction of the space station. But uh, if you didn't know already, on board that space shuttle was this banner from the Jerusalem YMCA and the children's program that they have there, where it was a banner made by the, the children's in that preschool who were Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. And we flew this banner with our handprints all in the back um, as a gesture of goodwill for you know, what the Jerusalem YMCA is doing. And when you go across the street from the King David Hotel, you can walk into the front of the Jerusalem YMCA and see that banner you know, now today as a memento from that flight. Um, the uh, Turns out the, the connection with my family and, and Israel is the fact that on the right side, you see the, the tombstone of my wife's uh, great uncle, who was responsible for building the Jerusalem YMCA. And then the, also up on the, the Sea of Galilee or up on Tiberias, the YMCA called Peniel on Galilee. That's where he's buried at the chapel up there. And so that is our, our family connection to, to Israel. Now, some of the interesting training astronauts too is we go to extreme environments. This is a cave in Sardinia where we took astronauts and lived and worked underground for a week at a time. It was an international crew with Japanese, Russian, French, British, and myself. And we learned to work in this extreme environment, which no one, none of us had ever been in. It was like a whole other planet down there when you went underneath, underneath the earth. So there were no pathways, there was no lights. It was another planet every step you took. And so it was really, really an amazing experience to get used to where the sun never came up and you would have to look at your watch to see what time it was because you couldn't, couldn't tell what, what time it was to go to sleep. It was really easy to overwork and just keep work because you didn't have the sun to tell you, oh, it's, it's you know, nighttime, it's time, get ready, time to go to bed. We also went to the extreme environment uh, underwater off the coast of Sea Largo where we had the habitat called Aquarius where we went and lived and worked underwater for a week at a time, became aquanauts. A cavenauts in Italy and aquanauts uh, in Florida. And this is where, you know, being living underwater in a dangerous environment because you're doing saturation diving and you can't just, you know, have a problem on one of our uh, EVAs and go to the surface because your body's so saturated. You actually have to do decompression diving to be able to come back up. So it was, again, another environment we take astronauts to put them into so that they can be completely out of their element. And then when they go to space, it's just another extreme environment, not the first time, and, they, and they're overwhelmed by it. Got a chance then again to fly in space uh, aboard the Soyuz rocket. This is in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Came off the same launch pad that the first human in space launched off, Yuri Gagarin. And after four orbits or six hours later, we were on the International Space Station. It was, it was amazing. And uh, you know, here's you know, one of Elon Ramon's quotes. Uh, and it's neat that uh, you know, astronauts can contribute to human life here on Earth. And that's what the space station has been doing for these 25 years. The space station, you know, in the harshest environment known to humans, plus 250 degrees in the sun, minus 250 degrees in the shade. But yet 
humans have been living and working there and doing science and figuring out how to live in this extreme environment for you know more than two decades. You know, I never thought as a kid that you know I'd be able to go outside and do something like this. That just amazed me. I was always interested in space, but I never thought that it, you know I could actually do it. And so here's a little video of what it looks like when you go outside space on a spacewalk and the hatch on the space station is on the very bottom side. So imagine being 400 kilometers up from the surface of the earth, moving at 25,000 kilometers per hour, and you got to go outside the bottom of it and everything your whole life and your natural physical reaction is, oh my goodness, if I let go, I'm going to fall these 400 kilometers down to the surface of the earth. And you have to overcome that physical fear that's just so natural and you have to do what you train for. So we have a you know huge training pool and we have a whole space station underwater. We go in the spacesuits, use the same tools and we learn to just force our bodies to calm down and do what we train to do um, and uh, go out and do these spacewalks to repair and, and build the space station. And that's what it looks like. Here's a picture of what it looks like to go 25,000 kilometers per hour where you're, you're moving, you know, more than 10 kilometers every second. And you can see how quickly, you know, the Earth's moving underneath there and how everything's floating. Um, and, you know, for those who might have had the question, um, this definitely shows you that the Earth is not flat. And so it uh, definitely is round and we go around it every 90 minutes when you're moving that fast. Now, some of the, the fun stuff we get to do is, is uh, eat. And so this is a, a little video that my uh, crew and I put together where we got these fresh pizza dough and we made the pizzas. So we got some tape on the table that kind of holds things in place. But other than that, you can see how everything floats otherwise. And that's how these fl edible flying saucers uh, are, are what they're doing while we're floating around. And so we made them up, wrapped them in foil, warmed them up in our in our oven there that Paolo's opening up. Then we you know, didn't have a pizza roller to cut it. We had to use some scissors to, uh, to cut the pizza. And that was a fresh meal, which was just amazingly delicious. I've got the meat lovers over on my side. Paolo's got the Italian one, and that was our uh, where we eat uh, eat our meals there in Node One. You know, and being able to sit there and, and look out the cupola on the bottom side was like a glass bottom boat, and this was where we would spend as much you know for me as a photographer as much time as possible, um, just being able to look and gaze at the Earth because every time you went around it, you know the Earth is rotating underneath um, where the space station's orbit is, and so. You moved a little bit to the east every time you did an orbit and it was different every time the lighting was different the weather was different so the earth never was the same twice when you looked out that window and so that's why it was always fascinating to look out and you know this is a picture i took on uh, my one of my first evas but certainly uh the words from elon are certainly ring true that when you look at see how thin and fragile that atmosphere is and that that's the only reason why there's life on this planet compared to anywhere else and that's what's so exciting about the James Webb Telescope and everything we're learning about, you know, uh, the exploration of space now that there could be other planets that might could support life. And we would get finally getting the technology to be able to figure out where they are. And that's why the human exploration right now is so important to figure out to get the technologies to transport us to places like that that are long, uh, you know, long ways away. But, you know, look back at the Earth is certainly uh, gorgeous. This is what an aurora looks like from the top as we fly over it. And it's moving and undulating, kind of like the waves of an ocean, as you see this cosmic radiation hit the upper parts of the atmosphere and excite the, the particles. And then here's a bunch of pictures that I took of Israel while I was up there. Now you see the, a good picture of Israel there at nighttime. Coastlines, you can certainly see Tel Aviv, and then just in from that, you can see Jerusalem. You know, this is looking up from, from the Dead Sea to the north and all to uh, Lebanon. Directly overhead, you know, seeing the... Uh, uh, so there's Haifa up there in the north, and then here's Haifa at night, and you can see the difference. And then certainly uh, up here in the Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, and then, you know, looking back down to the southwest, seeing the Sinai and Israel, uh, Israel and then the Sinai beyond it, and then the Red Sea. And this is, uh, this is a picture I took. I was able to find, you know, Jerusalem, you know, moving at you know, more than 10 kilometers an hour, you know, from 400 miles up, and get this picture where you can see you know, the Temple Mount. And then just towards the, uh, uh, you know, the, to the bottom right side of the picture, you can actually pick out the King David Hotel. You can see the Jerusalem YMCA where that banner was that, uh, that I flew on my, on my space shuttle flight. 
Um, so that was certainly uh, something that was a challenge and, and really appreciated when I was able to get that picture. Um, this gives you an idea of what it's physically like uh, to be in space where it's, it's fun. You, you, you're going to, you know, go to the trash can or go to the bathroom or pick up a piece of equipment. You can just float around. It's, it's joyful. You never see astronauts not smiling in space because it's just so much fun just to go anywhere. Um, not to mention the views and the other things we get to do, but you see it's kind of busy in there, but the ceiling is the floor and the floor is the ceiling because gravity is not, not a factor. And so we're able to work on all different uh, surfaces. This is my, my uh, room, my up on the ceiling. And it, it was uh, never, never a dull moment. You can see how busy the inside of the space station is with all the wires for all the experiments and the freezers and the computers and all of that. It was really just a really neat time. But we're doing all this to get ready to go beyond low Earth orbit. And that's where the Artemis program comes into uh, play right now. All these elements are going to come into play to put humans on the moon, not just for a couple hours or a couple of days like we did during Apollo, but to go there in an effort to stay longer and longer and eventually, you know, live and work on the moon continuously. You know, it's the Artist McCords or, you know, there's even more signatories now. And certainly you can see Israel was a, is a part of that. And that's the new set of international laws and customs that we're all going to be operating within so we can do the peaceful exploration of outer space. You know, November of 2022, a little over a year ago, we had that first flight of Artemis One that went around the moon with an uncrewed vehicle. It was amazing to see this huge rocket, the most powerful rocket that humans have ever built, go out and launch into space um, louder than you know even the, the space shuttle or any any other rockets and this thing launched off on a 26-day mission taking an artemis capsule proving out that the service module built by the european space agency and the orion built by america and the sls rocket built by america could go up there and execute one of these missions um, safely enough that we could actually you know consider putting humans on the next flight orion is the space capsule itself it can hold four astronauts for up to 21 days just by itself. But if we dock to something else, we can extend uh, the duration. It has its own propulsion, its own solar arrays, its own communications capabilities. Um, and it sure sent back some amazing selfies as you know, the moon was big as it's just after it launched. But then shortly after that, all of a sudden the Earth became small as the moon became big as it went to this you know, distant destination and came around the moon. It, uh, you know, came back into Earth's atmosphere at a temperature, you know, Mach 32 instead of the, the Mach 25 patch that I have coming back from low Earth orbit. And we recovered it in, in the ocean and then got all the data from it to inform what we're going to be able to do for the next Artemis II mission. And this is the first time that humans are going to leave Earth since 1972. And that's coming up now, September of 2025. So a little more than a you know, year and a half from now, four humans are going to leave Earth and go around the moon on this what we call free return trajectory. They're going to launch from Earth, get grabbed by the lunar gravity, get swung around, kind of like if you were running along and you had a pole and you put your hand on it, the, you know, it would grab you and swing you around you know, 180 degrees. That's what lunar, the lunar gravity is going to do the Artemis II and send it back to Earth. It's going to be a 10 day mission. It'll be the first time we put humans out beyond low Earth orbit. Then subsequent flights, this is not a picture of a, a lunar space station. That's actually the International Space Station with a backdrop of the moon, but we're actually gonna build a space station called Gateway. It's gonna be in lunar orbit. You can see we've got European partners and UAE has just signed on to be a partner to build a module. And so this is gonna be continuing to be the international partnership of humans going, be out, going out and doing human exploration together. And, you know, the ultimate goal is to put humans on the moon again. Here's what the, you know, last time the humans went to the moon, this is the size of the lander that we had. You can see a rover off to the left side with a, one of the astronauts in a spacesuit uh, in between the two wheels. Look how big that human is compared to the, the lander. Well, here's the SpaceX Starship. At the very bottom between those feet, you can see how big the human is. You know, this thing is 50 meters tall and has an amazing you know, payload and capability and space uh, to be able to you know, go back to the moon and live there you know, for longer periods of time. SpaceX is already testing this. Everybody's already seen the stuff that's on online from the starships that were doing their testings back to Boca Chica to now where they're testing the starship, which is the black one on top and their super heavy booster down below where they've had now two flights. 
and they're incrementally getting farther and farther into their flight profile. They're trying to launch here in the next month. So be watching for that to get to orbit and then prove out this technology. Um, and that's what's going to be able to allow humans on the Artemis 3 flight to finally get to the moon and start doing science again. Very ambitious uh, science program because we've had satellites and now we're sending rovers to be able to show where the volatiles are. We say volatiles, we mean water, ice. If there's ice, then we can go ahead and get to it. We can turn that into ice turns into water, water turns into its two components. I call it, you know, we say H2O, but the H means rocket fuel, oxygen is that's what we, the air we need to breathe. If we can use that on the moon and break that down into those two parts, we can fuel our rockets to get home. We can have our oxygen there for humans. And guess what? When we look at going places farther in the solar system, we already know there's ice on Mars. If we could send a robotic mission to Mars and have it mine the ice and fill up the tanks for hydrogen, fill up the tanks for oxygen, and then launch humans with those two things waiting for them, that's a whole lot of stuff we don't have to take. And so we can build smaller, more agile, you know, uh, spacecraft to take the humans there because they don't have to carry all their return you know, uh, fuel and they don't have to carry all the oxygen they need for the mission. And so that's going to really make us be able to move to Mars quicker and probably safer because we have a smaller launch vehicle. You know, part of the moon stuff is we're going to the lunar south crater. And this is what it looks like because the sun looking onto the south pole has a very low grazing angle. So we're going to try and go to the areas and land in areas that are in sunlight but go check out the areas that are in shadow because that's where all those ice um, ice uh, deposits uh, are. And so that's going to be the very interesting new part about lunar exploration from the last time when the Apollo missions went to the equatorial levels. This is kind of the lunar rover that the Apollo astronauts had, very light, very capable, allowed them to go farther beyond uh, from their spacecraft than if they were just walking. And we're going to have an LTV, a lunar terrain vehicle that's similar, where they'll go out in their spacecraft and it's more of a, a dune buggy type affair. But we're also having our, our Japanese partners build a pressurized rover for later missions where there's a pressurized area that the crew can go out away from their lunar lander for days. And that will really expand the, the possibilities um, to explore beyond where the lander actually lands. And eventually, having habitats on the lunar surface where we can live and work and prove out all this technology because the moon is just the first step. The ultimate goal, you know, in, in right now in our lifetime is to get to Mars. And if things work and are, survive on the moon for long times, they're gonna work on Mars. And we've brought down a whole lot of risk on our habitats and the seals and the, the gears and the spacesuits and all this stuff, such that when we go to Mars, it's just the length of the journey and the distance from Earth, it'll be the challenge because we know we have confidence in our equipment because we proved it on the, Mar on the moon. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about, you know, possible life on other planets. This is our Milky Way. This is just one little, you know, soda straw view of our Milky Way seen from the space station. You can look at how the center of that picture, um, the stars, it's, it's almost solid white because there's so many stars out there, just in our tiny little Milky Way galaxy. That's not, you know, talking about all these other galaxies. And all these stars are bigger than the little white dwarf sun that we have in our solar system, which has nine planets. Yes, Pluto is a planet in our solar system. So if our little sun has nine planets, how many other planets are out there? Because this isn't the planets, this is the suns that are out there. And so there's a whole lot of exploring to do. And this is the time that we are really getting started. So I'll kind of close out with a quote from um, Elon Ramon. Um, and, you know, certainly it uh, bears truth, you know, then it bears truth, you know, for Aton having flown his flight, it bears truth today. And certainly the young people of Israel are part of taking, you know, Elon Ramon's thoughts and hopes for the future uh, and making it a reality. If you want to go ahead and take a look at what it's like and feel a little bit of what it's like to be a human in space, um, there's a video if you just Google NASA Sound of Silence, you can go see a video that my crewmates and I, we are the ones that took the pictures in the video and got permission from the band to put to a piece of music. And as you all know, music can evoke emotions. And when you put the emotions with the pictures, that's the best we could do to try and take you with us into space and show you what it was like. And so that's a, an opportunity for you to do that at home and put it on the big screen and turn up the volume and really uh, enjoy, you know, 
the, the point where you can see Earth from space until the point where you can get there yourself. And then hopefully, you know, someday, you know, this picture from Apollo will maybe turn into this. And I look forward to seeing uh, future Israeli un unmanned and uncrewed flights as well as crewed flights. And so, you know, NASA and what mission we're doing now and with our international partners is about the peaceful exploration of outer space for everyone. And we look forward to Israel being and Israeli people being certainly a part of that future. So I'd be happy to uh, take any questions at this time. Okay, we're going to take a few questions now from uh, students. Hi, Randy. Shmi Bar. I'm from Tesho Mechulun. I'd like to know how it's going to be in Khalifat Khalam. Is it nice? Is it good? Well, um, as I mentioned before, we train in that spacesuit underwater. And so you get very familiar with it, the suit itself. On Earth, it's very heavy, 300 pounds. I'll let you guys, you know, tell me how many kilos that is. Um, but it's your own personal spacecraft. It's a basically a bubble around you. And so, but it's inflated because it has to be able to have the air for you to breathe. So that means that we hold about 4.2 pounds of pressure per square inch inside the suit. So it's inflated. So if you were to take a, uh, a basketball and try and bend it or a football and try and bend it, it's kind of hard. Well, that's what we have to do in the suit to be able to move. We have to fight the inflation of the suit, which has the air we need to breathe to be able to do the work. And so that's why it's a, it's a good workout. Um, we, we can customize and size the arms and legs and make it as comfortable as possible, but you're still floating within the suit. And so we train here on Earth at that pressure with those, you know, oven mitt type of gloves at those pressures with the tools that are made for big gloved hands. Uh, and so we can get familiar with it. The best part is when you get to space and as you saw in the video coming out the door and your whole vision, you know, because you got that big fishbowl in front of you, it's just space there's no window you're looking out of you're kind of like an airplane if you're an airliner you can look out the window oh that's beautiful but you still have this you know window frame you know and when you're flying in maybe an open cockpit airplane or an airplane that just has a bubble on top maybe an f-16 or f-35 where the, the only window frame is down here at your shoulders and everything else is all canopy um it's absolutely beautiful and the visual you know picture is amazing but in space the suit floats and so all it is is a mass. So think of yourself, you know, you know how much you weigh when you're on the ground, but when you're in the water, you can float, right? And so you have, you know that you can you have to put some energy in to get yourself moving in the water. Um, and then you, as you're moving, if you come up to a wall, you kind of got to stop yourself. Well, it's the same thing where we practice in the pool um, with the suits, but we had to overcome the viscosity or the thickness of the water to get the suit moving. And then we want to stop. All we do is take some of that energy out and the water slows us down. In space, it doesn't. So it takes, I mean, a little fingertip pressure to get the whole 350 you know, pounds of mass plus my mass, you know, so over 500 pounds of mass moving. And I just float on. If I do nothing, I would just keep floating. I would just float off the end of the space station. So when you get to where you want to, before you get to where you want to go, you have to start slowing down and, and breaking to slow down that mass um, to get where you want. So it's, it takes a little bit of getting used to from the you know, tra you know practicing it on Earth to doing it in space, but it ends up being pretty comfortable. But it is a workout. You know, we say space walk, but your legs are doing nothing. <laughs> it is all your hands and arms moving you to where you want to go. You know, working with the tools to be able to do whatever task you have to do, handling the equipment, doing the drill, taking care of the bolts. Um, and so this is something that has to be strong. In your forearms, your arms, your upper body. To be able to do the spacewalks, which we typically are doing anywhere between you know six and a half to seven and a half hours outside, um, and That's you know day and night cycles. You know, I mentioned we are uh, traveling at twenty five thousand kilometers per hour. So you go around the Earth every ninety minutes, which means forty five minutes you have a sunset. Forty five minutes later you have a sun sunrise, and then forty five minutes later you have a sunset. And so you're trying to work outside the space station. You got to turn your lights on. And then forty five minutes later you got to turn your lights off. You know, and it's just all part of this, you know, amazing environment that you're in your own personal spacecraft operating in while you're out on a spacewalk. W would you say it's the hardest thing to do uh, while you are in space, in, in the space, space Definitely. station? Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Because it is a physical as well as a, a mental challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we mentioned it being a harsh environment. The suit protects you from that. Um, but 
uh, it's one of those things where you're in a bubble and you don't want to poke it on anything. You don't want to, you know, overstress it. Um, it. It's keeping you alive, but it also allows you to, you know, you have to do the work out there. And so you have this physical task that I've talked about. You have this mental task going, I only have a certain amount of oxygen in my suit. I only have the capability to scrub out the carbon dioxide that I'm breathing for a certain amount of time. And you have all these tasks to do because we always plan on more tasks than you can ever do. I would call it the get ahead list. Um, because if you get work done, that time is so precious to be, uh, to be out on the spacewalk that we try and get as much possible additional work done uh, in the amount of time we have of the, we say the consumables or the mm -hmm. oxygen uh, and CO2 scrubbing in the suit. So it is a, the, you know, the biggest challenge mentally and physically. And so as a, a fighter pilot and test pilot, I love it. You know, it's just like, wow, you feel very alive and very, you know, productive and satisfied when you come inside from an EVA, you know, having gotten all that stuff done and, and braved the uh, harsh environment of space in your own personal spacecraft. היי רנדי, שמי אורי, אני בת 15 נשאר, רציתי לדעת האם כוכבים וכוכבי לכת נהיים אחרת מהחלל. Do they look different? Well, we're only 400 kilometers closer to them than you guys are on the ground. But we don't have that atmosphere you know, in our way. We don't have light pollution from the cities and, and everything around us. And we don't have the attenuation of the atmosphere um, to uh, diminish the, the lights coming from the light coming from the stars. So. Um, you know, you know, when you see a light in the distance um, here on Earth, you know, it, as you get closer, it seems like it's getting brighter because the wavelengths of light can get to you easier because it's not looking through the atmosphere. On space, no atmosphere. And so you can see from some of those pictures, especially that that uh, video of the Milky Way. It's like I, I equate it to when I was flying at high altitudes with night vision goggles on where, you know, you look out and you see, you know, a bunch of stars, you put the goggles on and there's hundreds times more stars. Well, you can see from my video, there's thousands of times more stars, you know, where in that one camera view, it was almost solid white because of the number of stars you can see from space. So it was only 400 you know, kilometers closer. It is a phenomenal view with tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands more stars that you can see here on Earth. שלום, קוראים לי מיכאלה, מכיתה ד' 2, בבית סופר אורן הפורט, בהוד השרון. רציתי לשאול, איך זה לישון בחלל, והאם זה בכלל משפיע על החלומות? All right, two parts there, okay. To me, sleeping in space is the best sleep I've ever had. Really? Because right now, all of us, when we lay down in our bed, gravity's you know, pulling us into the bed, right? And if you want to roll on your side, well, your shoulder's a little wider than your waist. And then your legs, well, if you put them on top of each other, your knees are hitting. Um, or if you lay on your back, if you have a blanket or something on your feet, well, it's kind of pressing down your toes. So do your toes do this or do you do that? And so there's always these little things that we have to adjust. Oh, not to mention the pillow. Does a pillow you know, keep your head at the right level? If you turn on your side, you know, is it enough to prop up between your shoulder and your head? And all these things that we don't realize that, you know, wake us up or have us move, you know, while we're sleeping. In space, wow, we have these sleeping bags that are tethered to the wall because you're floating the whole time. And the sleeping bag isn't there to, um, as much to, uh, to cover you as to basically hold you in place while you float. And so you hop in your sleeping bag, you zip it up, and then you're just floating within your sleeping bag. And your muscles and your whole body just goes to where it totally relaxes. Imagine getting in a swimming pool. Lay it on your back, taking a deep breath, filling your lungs up, and then just not moving your arms and legs and having that type of sensation for sleeping. And so the whole, I didn't wake up at all during the night because I was uncomfortable or felt, you know, something wrong with the pillow or, or my knees were hitting or the blanket. And so I slept on in space and it was so much better. I felt like, you know, I slept like six hours in space was like sleeping nine or 10 hours on earth. And so um, the dreams for me, I don't dream that much or remember my dreams. In space, I didn't have much difference. Um, I, t you know, if, if anything, I would say that I slept less because I was just such a solid sleep. Um, it was just, you know, I woke up so refreshed in the mornings. It was, it was great. So we have to collect all our trash on space station because there's, there's no, you know, garbage truck uh, that comes every week to buy our house. Um, and we have, you know, dry trash, which is not that bad, but you can imagine, you know, wet trash, food, you know, 
things, uh, things like that, or just the human waste that we produce because we don't have toilets that can flush and go down to a sewer and get processed in a water treatment plant. So you can imagine you're living inside of a tin can with uh, all your friends up there on the space station and this wet trash, it smells. So we have to collect it and then put it in containers such that it doesn't let that smell out all over the space station. Then we have an area uh, in the permanent uh, logistics module where we stow all the trash bags, wet and dry trash. And then we get supply ships that come up uh, every few months that we take all those good supplies and bring them up like the pizzas that I showed you earlier, all that fresh food. We'll unpack all the scientific experiments, food, um, and anything else. And then we'll take all that trash and put it on the supply vehicle because the Cygnus supply vehicle, the progress supply vehicle, um, those things actually burn up in the atmosphere. And so when they're filled with trash, they come back, they re-enter, and because they don't have heat shields on them, they'll actually burn up and it'll get incinerated basically. And so that's how we burn up our trash. So, you know, one funny thing is, is, well, that's the dry trash, that's the wet trash, that's the human trash. Well, on space station, we're actually using a urine processing facility such that we are taking uh, the urine from the, from the crew members, processing it, taking out all the bad stuff. And we are actually using that to reclaim about 85, 90% of the water that is on the space station. So that has real world applications to people that live in deserts and places without a whole lot of water. Um, and, uh, but that also means the, uh, the number two um, human uh, excrement, um, that one we cannot reprocess, fortunately. And that just goes into cans. And those cans go on these spacecraft that uh, burn up in the atmosphere. So the next time you look up and see a shooting star, it may not be a meteorite. It could be flaming poop from space. היי רנדי, שמי דון, בן 11, מחולון. הייתי שמח להיות אסטרונאוט, אבל שמעתי שזה די מסוכן בגלל הקרינה וחולשות העצמות. איך אתה שומר על עצמך בריא בחלל, וגם כשאתה חוזר לארץ? Yes, it's dangerous, but there are a lot of dangerous jobs here on Earth too. Certainly the environment and not having the atmosphere to protect us from the radiation uh, is, is a factor. And so the radiation is higher up there, but it's not that much different than someone who works at a nuclear power plant, for example. Uh, and so we monitor all of that to understand how much dosage you're getting. Um, when we go out beyond low earth orbit and beyond outside the Van Allen radiation belts that protect the earth from a lot of that cosmic radiation, that's when humans are gonna be at a lot more um, radiation doses when we start doing the Artemis missions and certainly on the eight month journey to Mars. So we, you know, radiation shielding, radiation monitoring um, are certainly a big part of how we plan our missions. Um, now, as far as the human body, we make sure that we are in the best shape we can be bef before we go to space because the human body, um, when the muscles aren't being used, they atrophy, right? Think about older people when they come bedridden and their muscles aren't as strong, that then takes the pressure off the bones and the bones lose density. And then Older people are more prone to breaking their bones with osteoporosis and things like this because the human body's not being as challenged as much. So when you go to space, it's like, you know, being in the point where you're in, in a, living in a bed for months at a time. And so we exercise and that's what the beauty of the space station has shown us in the last two decades. Exercise devices have developed from where we were initially on the space station. We had limited exercise devices and people come back with a lot of bone loss to where I went up, you know, uh, in 2017. And I had two and a half hours a day where I was working out. One hour either cycling or one hour running on a treadmill. Treadmill, if I push my foot down, it would push me off into the ceiling. So we had a harness, we had bungee cords that held us down. So when I you know, took a step and pushed off, it would pull me back down so I could continue running you know, and keep my feet on the treadmill. We had a bicycle that didn't have a seat. You just got on, you just pedaled and you're just floating the rest of the time. And then, but then we had a work, a, a resistive exercise device that simulated uh, um, weightlifting because there's no weight in space. We had to actually react against a platform and we had vacuum chambers so we could dial anywhere from 40 to, to I think 600 pounds and do all types of exercise to keep all the muscles on our body strong, to keep the tension on our bones so that we were healthy, had core strength and didn't lose any bone uh, density. And so I got back after my you know five months and had you know practically no bone density loss. So we we've been using the test bed of the International Space Station to figure out how to avoid having the human bodies um, 
uh, degrade when we're in that challenging environment. Fascinating. Um, astronaut Red, Randy Bresnik, uh, this has been fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your time and effort to meet us. We wish you luck on your space exploration and we'll keep following you to space and back. Oh, that's great. And I wish all of you guys a great time this uh, space week um, and remembering, you know, Elon Ramon and, and what he, his sacrifice, but also looking the path forward and the men, incredible opportunity that, that you individually have as a student to become involved and study something in science, you know, and get involved in technology, engineering, math, and then be a part of this space exploration in the future. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Shalom. Shalom.